welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. We're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. One of our longtime favorites here at the Western Museum of Flight, who is of course always welcome amongst us and who has graced us not only with his presence, but with this magnificent example of World War II fighter plane technology, the famous Japanese Zero, is back again by popular demand. And please remain after the lecture, both pilots will be conducting tours of their aircraft and answering questions about the features, capabilities, and combat histories. And now, Colonel Rob Lips Hertberg, the podium is yours. Good morning. Hey, we're really uh, happy you could join us uh, this morning. Tom and I are extremely pleased to be here and to be able to talk to you uh, about a moment in history and how that has rolled into 75 years later uh, a couple treasures out here, aviation treasures that, that we're honored to be able to share with you uh, this morning. So we're going to go back to uh, 42 early 42 and 43, and we're going to talk a little bit about the Battle of Darwin, and we're going to kind of focus more on the Zero and the P-40. Now, for those of you who have, who have kind of tracked this event through early advertising, we had started it with the Spitfire and the Zero. Uh, we weren't able to get the Spitfire here. A lot of times with these old airplanes, sometimes you have to deal with the fact that it's an old airplane. Well, for this weekend, that old airplane is doing just fine. It was the old pilot that needed to stay in the hangar this weekend. Okay, here's what we've got in store for you today. We're going to uh, bounce through some slides on this presentation about the airplanes, about the conflict. Uh, we are going to talk uh, a little bit about these two airplanes in particular after we talk about uh, the battle and some of the dog fights. Then we're gonna open it up for some questions uh, for the audience here. That's gonna take us roughly to about noon time. Uh, there is a timeline. We don't wanna short anybody, but there is a timeline. So at roughly noon, what we would like to do for those interested is we're gonna split the crowd. We're gonna put half the crowd on the P-40 with Tom, the other half of the crowd with me on the Zero, and we're just gonna kinda do a walk around and get up close and personal uh, to these icons and uh, kind of reinforce some of the things that we talked about during the presentation. And then roughly 1.30, we're gonna tow the airplanes out, we're gonna fire them up, and we're gonna go fly for you if you wanna hang around. Okay, so starting on the road to battle, kind of preface here, here's how Tom and I are gonna individually talk about our aircraft, our respective aircraft, and their development. A little bit about the service, the military service requirements that led to the designs uh, when they were accepted. We kind of have a sliding timeline uh, to follow uh, the development of the airplanes. We'll talk a little bit about the pilot training for the two different sides, and uh, there was a fairly radically different approach. Um, we'll look at the combat experience of the two airplanes leading up to this Battle of Darwin, and then we'll compare the two airplanes. So I get to start first, and so I'm gonna talk about the uh, Mitsubishi Zero. So it was October 1937, when the Imperial Japanese Navy recognized or decided they needed a new airplane. So they issued uh, a tasker to the Japanese aviation industry to build prototype 12. And where the 12 came from, the number 12, was 1937 was the 12th year of the reign of the current empire. The requirements from the IGN were, at the time, extremely stringent. So much so that Nakajima, which was building military combat aircraft at the time, withdrew from the competition. They said, we can't build that airplane. So that left Mitsubishi and they tackled the problem. And you can see up there some of the specifications, the requirements that the IGN levied on industry. Greater than 300 miles an hour, it needed to have a range of 1,100 nautical miles, 
uh, that's, that's an incredible distance at the time for a carrier-based fighter-sized airplane. It needed to have the maneuverability and its role was to be an escort fighter and an interceptor. This is a, a key point. It needed a wingspan less than 39 feet so it could fit on the aircraft carriers of the day on the elevators up and down from the hangar deck to the flight deck. Needed to have some direction finding equipment to help the pilots in navigate and get to the target and get back home in the vast expanse of the Pacific. Uh, some of this dogfighting performance that the IGN wanted was based on their combat experiences uh, in the Chinese war that was going on in Manchuria and in China. So here's what Mitsubishi did. They designed a, a low wing monoplane with very, very low wing loading. And wing loading is pretty much just easy math. What is the overall wing area of the airplane and the weight? The bigger the wing, the lighter the aircraft, the lower the wing loading. Lower wing loading typically means you have a lower stall speed, but that also means you have a lower fighting speed, which was critical. Okay, it also means it generally drives a very, very maneuverable airplane with a low wing loading. Oh, I'm gonna go back one. You see the photograph? That was the aircraft that preceded the Zero. So that's what they had at the time, carrier-based, open cockpit, fixed landing gear. So they wanted to improve upon that with the technologies of the day. So Mitsubishi designed an enclosed cockpit, retractable landing gear, of note, uh, all through the design of this, keeping the aircraft light was critical because it had to be light to get the range and the maneuverability that the Navy required. So they decided to build the forward fuselage and the wing is one piece. The tail cone uh, bolts onto it, but the wing, they got a, a photo a little later that kind of illustrates it, the wing and the forward fuselage is one piece. What that allowed them to do was help keep it light because it didn't need any structure uh, for that uh, connection like uh, most of our airplanes, but it made it a little bit more time consuming to produce as well. Okay, they added to it a, it's imperceptible to the eye, but the leading edge of the wing tips are swept forward. And what that did was it allowed the wing tips, the wing tips are the first to stall. If you have wind and an aircraft with an angle of attack increasing, you get to a point where the wing's no longer producing enough lift to support the weight of the aircraft. Well, the first thing to stall is the wing tips because you have lift is, is developed by air over the wings. On the wing tips, you have air on the sides of the wing tip. So they're the first to stall. So this slight bend forward helped those wingtips to stall later. Again, slow stall speed means I can get down right there to a slow fighting speed. At the time of design here, uh, 37, 38, 39, they designed it with extremely heavy firepower. So they had two 7.7 .7 millimeter uh, machine guns. That's about 30 caliber and those were mounted on the top of the fuselage, synchronized flying through the propeller. But in the wing tips, they put one each, one in each wing, uh, 20 millimeter cannons. That's extremely heavy firepower for the start of the war. And that's about an 80, 80 caliber. So that's a big slug. Okay, flush riveted helped with a drag and that helped it get very long range, which was a requirement. Very lightweight, as you can see up there. The 5,300 pounds combat loaded zero, uh, as an example, that's half of the weight of an F6F Hellcat. So very lightweight, so it could go these long distances and then fight and, and beat aircraft in a dogfight. Japanese industries at the time was experimenting with a very light and yet strong aluminum for the skin, the Duralumin. They also kind of pioneered the use of lightning holes. So imagine a piece of aluminum and you can cut holes in it and you can reduce the weight while maintaining the strength. So lightning holes were uh, heavily used throughout the uh, construct of the airplane. 
Uh, came, uh, there was a cost though, no armor and no self-sealing fuel tanks. That would have added unnecessary weight to the airplanes. You can see I've uh, put a couple asterisks by that, uh, that when the Allies started shooting back, those limitations became just that. And also for weight, the, the 20 millimeters were extremely heavy firepower, but they could only carry 60 rounds per gun. Uh, that can go really fast when you're in a swirling dogfight. Okay, a little bit of kind of about the mnemonics of the aircraft. You know, A6M2, A6M3, Type 0, Model 21. A lot of numbers in there, and there was a kind of very, at least to me, very interesting uh, concept behind that, and it, they just didn't pull it uh, out of their rear. So A6M, A stood for uh, carrier-based. The six meant it was the sixth in the series of carrier-based fighters. M meant it was manufactured by Mitsubishi. And in the case of our airplane, the three was the third major version. So A6M2 was the second major version. The aircraft was accepted, first flew in April of 39. It was accepted by the IGN in the summer of 1940. And so what they did, if you looked at 1940, that was Imperial year 2600. So their standard was to take the last two digits of the Imperial year that the aircraft was accepted into service, zero, zero, and it became the type zero. And hence with fourth 70, 80 years later, we're calling that a zero. A Little bit of the development, the way they use the model numbers, model 21, model 32, model 52, they used the airframe was the X, if you will, the engine was the Y, as they made major modifications to it. So the A6M1, Model 11, was the prototype in 1939. It started with a two-bladed wooden propeller. So here we are, if you look back at that A5M Claude, they're trying to make a fairly significant evolutionary or revolutionary jump in the technology of their airplanes. But it still started with a two-bladed wooden propeller. This is Mitsubishi. They had a Kinsei engine producing about 780 horsepower, and that's what they started with on the prototype. They made three. First one crashed, uh, came apart in testing, and that's where the Japanese started learning about what we'll call the fragility of the airplane. So that lightness started to show some manifestations that were going to end up not being good. Uh, on the third one, the Japanese Navy had heard about an engine that Nakajima was making that was about the same size, about the same weight, but had more horsepower. So they told Mitsubishi, let's put this Nakajima on that third prototype and see how we do. And they liked it. They liked it a lot. So when they went to the A6M2, which came out in 40, that was the first production model. It had the folding wingtips, where all you have to do is look to the right and see what I mean. Folding wingtips. If you remember from the requirements, it needed to be 39 feet or less to go up and down on the carrier elevators. 39 feet, 4 inches. Bummer. <laughs> okay? But the Navy loved the way this airplane was flying. So they said, don't change the wing, figure it out. So Mitsubishi figured it out. Remember how it had to be light? Think about a Corsair and how those wings hydraulically fold kind of in the middle of the wing. Well, what does that cost the Corsair? Weight, more structure, more strength, more hydraulics. Couldn't do it. So when we do a walk around for those entries, you'll see very easy, very basic mechanical contraption there to just gain about three feet of clearance by folding the wingtips. They did put the Nakajima engine, the Sake 12, had about 940 horsepower. That increased greatly the uh, power and the maneuverability. And this was the airplane, first production, that was the terror of the skies early in the war. So it was the one that went to China. That's the one we would have seen at Pearl Harbor in Darwin, as we'll talk about. And then all the way through Midway. The Japanese wanted to keep advancing, so they went to the Model 32. So the three is the change because they changed the airframe. They clipped the wings off. They clipped the wings, they put a bigger engine on it. So Nakajima had a slightly higher, what is it, 1130 horsepower. But let's go back to that wing loading. 
larger wing, lighter airplane. What did they just do? They sh reduced the wing area and they made it heavier. So the wing loading goes up. Higher stall speed, higher fighting speed, less maneuverability. The larger engine ate into some of the fuel that was in the fuselage in between the engine and the cockpit, so it didn't have the range. If you think about the time they're developing that, look at early 41, what's the Japanese Empire doing at that time? And so what do they want? Range. So you can see in red what happened. So the pilots had a vote. The Navy and, and Mitsubishi, they were smart. They, had, they were all focused. They had an objective. So they compromised. They came up with the Model 22. They, in essence, took a step backwards. They put on the larger folding wingtip wings of the Model 21, but they kept the bigger engine, more horsepower. That was the airplane that would have started making it into the frontline units about the time of the Solomons. So we're talking summer to fall of 42. They were progressing, they were learning, they were starting to see our advanced airplanes, our newer airplanes. So they did, this is a bit of a mystery model for uh, Mitsubishi, the A6M4, but they were experimenting with turbo supercharging and they just never got it right. Part of the reason the Japanese want, were doing this, this is expansion, was to get those natural resources, which they didn't have in the home islands. So they didn't have an abundance of the, the metals and all the other materials to get these, uh, these designs right and make a turbo supercharger work. So it didn't work. We never really saw an A6M4. But then they moved on a little bit later. This is kind of the end of this Battle of Darwin period, but I want to put it up uh, just because they went to the A6M5. So now they're starting to have really significant on the negative side, lessons learned fighting our newer airplanes, the P-38s, the Corsairs, by the end of 43, the Hellcat. And they're finding that this big wing, light or low wing loading, super maneuverable, isn't helping them. What they need is the speed because the American and Allied airplanes were diving away from them or diving to catch them. So they needed to do something to increase that top end. Remember that first prototype came apart, <coughs> physically came apart at 350 miles an hour. And now our airplanes are 400 to 450 miles an hour. So they did the F5. It was the most produced of the 11,000 zeros. Uh, shorter, increased the dive speed. They kept the same engine. That was one thing, a, uh, one of the surviving Japanese zeros was asked after the war if you could have done anything. One thing, what would it have been? And he said, I would have wanted more and more powerful engines. Kind of like the Allies and the Americans were able to do with their big Pratts. Okay, they did some armament upgrades uh, as well. Okay, so that's the history of the different models and how this thing got to what it is. Okay, so let's look at uh, briefly about the pilot training. This had a significant impact as well to the Japanese philosophy. So their primary uh, pilot training uh, institution, the Yukarin, if I said that right, was a very, very well-known, well-renowned institution producing superior naval aviators in the early 30s to the start of the war. But the philosophy, when you look at the grand strategy, especially when you talk about the attack on Pearl Harbor, kind of based on a knockout blow. We're gonna knock them out, we're gonna force them to sue for peace, or we're gonna expect them to do that, and it'll be a short war. So what you see here was they produced a small number, but that was about it. It was not, their pilot training program was not geared for a protracted war of attrition against an industrialized nation that could produce airplanes and pilots like the United States. And they also left their experienced pilots on the front lines. They didn't bring them back to train the new people. Okay, for operational zero training, uh, they were told like you would expect when you get, first get in that airplane, I have to learn how to fly the zero now. I've got my wings but uh, now I need to learn how to fly my combat airplane. They emphasized the strength, so the great maneuverability, 
the firepower, that 20 millimeter shell was uh, extreme firepower, they were taught to engage in slow speed fights. So do the dogfighting, the turning, get slow where this aircraft excels. Okay, and they were also told, you can see my little graphic up there, the divergence of the different calibers. That was also a challenge for a pilot, a zero pilot, especially a new one, was he had two different types of ordnance and he could select based on the target or his remaining ordnance. But look how they were not harmonized. So you couldn't line them up. You couldn't have a sighting picture sitting in the cockpit where both caliber bullets hit the same place at a certain range. We call that a harmonization range. So they had to adjust for that on the fly in the fight. There's also the fact that the, you know, the 20 millimeters was preferred, but they only had the 60 rounds in each wing. That's just not a lot when you're talking about a fur ball, when you're talking about multiple airplanes, dozens and dozens of airplanes on each side in this massive fur ball. And as, as we learned early when we started encountering these combat savvy pilots, there's no better training than combat. So here's where I get to throw <laughs> little Miss Sarah into the mix here. Okay, three reasons why you're looking at my granddaughter. One, they're my slides. I'm, well, whatever I want on here, okay? Two, she's just awesome and she digs me, okay? But more important to this morning, like the Zero, if you get to chasing this little hellion, she's got nearly unlimited range and is highly maneuverable. <laughs> okay, you're about done listening to me. We're gonna get Tom up here. Uh, combat experience. So here's where, when we, when we roll this all up into the Battle of Darwin and the fighting in the 42 and 43, Here's what really, really helped the, the Zero pilots as they were gonna start going up more and more against Allied fighters was they had a lot of combat experience. As soon as the Zero was accepted by the Navy, pow, into China they went and racked up a, an amazing score. It should be noted, not to take away from the aircraft or the Japanese pilots, but they were fighting against biplanes so the Chinese at the time had older fighters on their front line. Uh, first victories there in, in 40, that was with the A6M2. If you recall, the two model with the folding wings and the smaller engine was what was prevalent in China, Pearl Harbor, Darwin, Midway. Uh, dominated the skies. You can see some of the experience, uh, extensive experience in combat with this near revolutionary airplane uh, against the uh, other adversaries they were fighting. And then by mid-42, kind of when we care about the Battle of Darwin, uh, they were on cloud nine. They were using the strengths of the airplane and their excellent training that they got uh, to their advantage and they racked up quite a kill ratio. Okay. I'm going to hand this over to Tom. So in 1935, the Army Air Corps' primary fighter was the Boeing P-26 P Shooter, picture up here on the upper left-hand corner. P Shooter was a 220-mile-an-hour airplane. It was actually quite advanced for its day comparative to the biplanes that it replaced. The P Shooter won the 1932 contest for, for uh, fighter planes by the United States. So you can see it's a single wing airplane. It's uh, externally braced. It has an R R1340 on it, a controllable pitch propeller, and, uh, and an open cockpit. Compared to the biplanes, it was very advanced, very speedy, very maneuverable. In 1935, the US Army Air Corps announced a competition amongst the domestic manufacturers for new airplanes. And in 1935, the Curtis Aircraft Company had just flown what would become the P-36 aircraft, and it was called a Hawk 75. That's the airplane in the lower left-hand corner. Zversky uh, intended to submit an airplane that would become the P-35 to this competition, and Vought was going to uh, submit the 141. It had one of those flying airplanes as an example. The fight off was supposed to be in the latter part of May of 1935, and the Zversky airplane crashed on the way from New York to Dayton, Ohio, so it didn't make it. 
Uh, the Curtis airplane, the P-36, had just flown the first time in, in early May, so it was there waiting. And then the, the Northrop V-141 took off from California, made a left turn over the ocean, and disappeared, never, never to be seen again. So the U.S. Air, Army Air Corps uh, uh, delayed the, the actual fight off until April of 1936, which was a good thing because it gave both companies, the, the two primary contenders, meaning Curtis and Seversky, a chance to improve their designs. The, the, the Hawk P-36 is basically a P-40 with a round engine on it. And in 1935, uh, the, the Curtis company was, was using one of their own engines. So in 1929, Curtis and Wright Corporations merged 29 companies into the Curtis Wright Corporation, and they actually owned the Wright Engine Corporation. So the, P30, the P-36 started out using a Wright R-1670, about 950 horsepower, had a lot of problems. The airplane was not, not, a, not a good engine. They then uh, started using another engine, the R-1820, that went on to have, have greater success later in the war. That engine also wasn't, wasn't uh, reliable at the time and did not produce the power that they needed. So interesting enough, they started using a Pratt & Whitney R-1830. So here we have a company that owns the right engine company using a Pratt a Pratt & Whitney R-1830 on their design. Anyway, uh, in 1936, the, 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 the fly-off occurs, and Seversky, interestingly enough, wins the, wins the war, so to speak, uh, on a head-to-head -head battle with the Curtis P-36. And it was a, a bit interesting because the, the Seversky was a more expensive airplane, and it was not really a better performing airplane than the Hawk, but nonetheless, they, they won the contract, and they were awarded a bid for 77 airplanes. So they started producing the airplanes, they had a lot of problems with, with uh, deliveries and everything else. And the, the Army Air Corps became, became concerned that, that Seversky wouldn't be able to perform. So they gave an award for 210 airplanes to the Curtis Aircraft Company. And so they went into production with those. And Curtis built 210 Hawks for the, for the U.S. Army Air Corps and about 900 additional uh, Curtis Hawks that were exported. And they were exported to France as an example. France was the largest customer, and they had about 500 of those in service. And interestingly enough, when the Germans overran France, they actually took those airplanes and sold them to Finland. And so you had American airplanes owned by the Finnish fighting the Soviet Union in World War II. So that, that was kind of crazy. So during this, this period of time, the military is becoming very interested, again, in water-cooled aircraft engines. And prior to that time, we were using a lot of water-cooled water engines in the earlier days, like in the Jennies and back, back in those, those days. But they, they were not very reliable. They would, lose, they would leak coolant, they'd overheat. Uh, they were actually only using water for coolant. They hadn't figured out glycol yet. So when they started using glycol, they realized they'd be able to decrease the size of the, of the radiators about 50%. They'd be able to produce a much nicer engine. So, the Army Air Corps asked Curtis to put a, an Allison, a General Motors Allison engine, into the front of an airplane. So they took a P-36 Hawk and they put an engine on the front of it, recalled it, redid all the plumbing, and came up with the XP-40. The XP-40 was a very nice looking airplane. It went about 350 miles an hour, something like that. They were trying to get it faster, maybe 340, 350 miles an hour. So they worked on it to be able to get it faster. They ended up getting an order for 524 of those things as, as the P-40 from the Army Air Corps to be able to get rolling. Uh, the Army Air Corps was also looking at the forerunner of the P-38 and the P-39, but they felt the P-40 already in, essentially in existence. It was a very conservative design as opposed to a twin-engine P-38, for example, or a rear-engine P-39. So they thought that would be a much better way to be able to cover their, their bases as it were. So, they launched with the P-40, and over time, they, they actually built 14, about 14,000 P-40s from 1940 until through about 1944. They had several different variations of the P-40. Uh, they were experimenting with different engines, increasing the horsepower over the runs. They had the P-40. They, had, they built one P-40A. They built about um, about 1,100 P-40Bs. P-40Bs were what was used in China by the Flying Tigers and the AVG. They had the P-40E, uh, the D's and E's, had, uh, they went away from having two machine guns up in the nose and maybe one or two guns in the wing to having six 50 caliber guns actually in the wings. Amazingly accurate, had, had uh, great firepower, very, very effective weapon. The P-40F was interesting. 
the P40F actually experimented using a Packard, Rolls, a Packard Merlin, so essentially the same engine in the Mustang they put on the P40, and that created about a 35,000 foot high altitude airplane with it. Not a lot faster than an Allison P40, about 365 miles an hour, something like that. So the airframes didn't, just didn't have the cleanliness to be able to really get the higher speed that, for example, the Mustang would obtain. Then they moved on to the P40N, which is actually what this airplane out here is. P40N was stretched about two feet in the fuselage because they were going to bigger and bigger engines across the development of the airplane. They started out with about 1,000 horsepower. The, the last version of the P40N's uh, Allison actually had about 1,360 horsepower. So it was a much more powerful airplane. They felt the shorter coupled airplane was a little, a little bit crazy to try and maintain. So the longer fuselage provided better leverage to be able to control the airplane. Okay, so now moving on, on to our pilot training. Rob talked about the fact that the Japanese training was, was more specific to the early part of the war. Our training at, at the time, right before World War II, we had a capacity of training about 7,000 pilots a year. And that was for all, all services. Most of that training was being done down in, at um, Randolph Field in San Antonio. And as World War II became closer, Hap Arnold and, and the rest of the military decided that we needed to significantly amp up our pilot output. And they, they targeted 102,000 pilots a year. So they went from 7,000 to 102,000 pilots a year goal to try and cover our anticipated needs for pilots. We needed so many pilots, they decided to, to have the primary training pilot school be conducted by civilian pilot instructors. So they contracted with civilian pilot schools. At the time, it was the CAA, the forerunner of the FAA, and they certified their instructors. They had some military people come in. They brought back experienced instructors that had already had some combat time. They started flying the, uh, the Stearman, the PT-17. They started using the PT-22, the PT-19, PT-26. And they ended up having 50 flying schools around the United States to be able to conduct that training. They had about 60 hours of flight training in, in that program, about 12 weeks of service. Those that succeeded moved on to the next level, which was the basic training. Now, they had about a 40% washout rate in primary training. So it was, it was you know, it's almost one out of every two guys you know, if somebody was, was uh, failing, failing to advance. In the BT program, they went on to a little more powerful airplane. Instead of 220 horsepower or so, they, they moved up to 450 horsepower. They started having to manage flaps, constant speed propellers, and they focused on, on aerobatics, on cross-country training, formation flying, navigation, things such as that. It was about another 10 or 11 weeks, and they moved on to the advanced pilot training. Advanced pilot training had two tracks. The first track were the fighter guys. The fighter guys went into the T-6. They, they, they focused on aerial gunnery, they focused on more formation flying and probably more importantly on combat tactics. They spent another 60 or so hours doing that, then they would graduate and get their wings. The second track was for the, uh, the bomber transport pilots. And so they would start flying an AT-9, an AT-10, AT-11, uh, a UC-78 Cessna, also called an AT-17. And so they were focused on all the multi-engine stuff, less, you know, less combat roles and stuff were there. Uh, so, uh, a very robust training program. It was interesting to note that we produced 192,500 pilots from 1942 to the middle of 1945. And we had a fatality rate of 7%. So we lost about 13,500 instructors and pilots in that program just in the United States in training accidents. So it was a pretty, pretty hazardous uh, application. Um, as part of the, of the AT-6 training, they focused on what they've learned uh, with the Flying Tigers and other combat groups of the P-40, uh, learning how to, how to combat particularly the Zero and other air aircraft by using the, the advantage the airplane had. The P-40 was a very, very stout airplane, about 9 Gs of, of positive G-loading. The thing could dive at 480 miles an hour. If a Zero ever got faster than 350 miles an hour, particularly the, for the early ones, the skins would wrinkle. Sometimes the wings would come off. They couldn't roll, they couldn't turn. The Zero was a disaster over 250 miles an hour. That's all there was to it. So we learned, learned right away that if we could combat the Zero in our element, meaning fast, meaning diving, combat and settle level, slow flight, we could be very, very effective, and we were. Okay, combat experience of the P-40. P-40 was actually used in 24 countries around the world. And because it got into production in 1940 and was so widely produced, Curtis was building 60 airplanes a day. So you think about that. They had 45,000 employees, three factories around the United States. They were cranking these things out in mass. 
So in the very early part of the war, you can see they were in North Africa, they were in China with AVG in, in early, late 41, they were in Pearl Harbor, they were in the Philippines, they were in Australia, they were down in the, in the Dutch East Indies, they were everywhere. So the P-40 takes some, some flack by not being maybe the most fabulous airplane ever designed, but the P-40 for what it is, it was a fantastic airplane. Very maneuverable, very durable, great protection for the pilot. They had armor, armoring around the, the back of the pilot, the sides, they had, um, they had a bulletproof windshield, they had self-sealing fuel tanks. The airplane was really, really built well to help protect the pilot as opposed to what the Japanese had built at the time. Okay, do you want to talk about the comparison of the, yes, I do. the two monsters here? Thank you, Tom. That's not too bad of an eye test. Maybe it is. But well, here's a comparison. The information in each column, and we have the A6M2 Model 21 against a P40E. So the numbers in there are, are right out of uh, any document you might want to research, but their color coding is subjective, in my opinion. Okay, if you look at the, just the relative size, they're pretty equivalent. Okay, the P40 is a little longer. The uh, Zero has a slightly larger wingspan. But when we talk about the wing loading, which, which I talked about, that low wing loading, uh, I gave the favor to the uh, Zero because it was lighter weight, it had a lower wing loading, it could fly slower, better, so I gave it the edge there. The engine, uh, as Tom talked about, increasing horsepower. Uh, more so on a relative scale than the Zero did for the P-40, so I gave the edge to the P-40 because a fighter pilot can never have enough horsepower or thrust. I promise you that. More, more, more. Um, the uh, speed. The level speed doesn't show a great deal of difference here, and that's a max level straight speed, but it's still the P-40 had an edge, so I gave it to that. Uh, gave it to green, but also what's on there is the P-40 had such a superior dive speed where it could run away or catch a zero trying to dive away from a fight. Okay, the range was um, fairly significant. I gave that to the zero. The P-40 did not have a requirement for a great range, so that's not a hit against the P-40. Climb rate was something, if anything, in my uh, research of this, Probably the biggest weakness for the P-40, it was not a great climber, whereas the lightness of the Zero made it a good climb. And if you, when you talk about diving attacks and not getting into a horizontal turning fight, being able to dive and get back up was real important in those days with those type of tactics, one-on-one fighter-v-fighter -on -one, uh, -fighter tactics. So I gave the edge to the Zero. Zero had a slightly higher horsepower to weight ratio. The armament, very interesting here. Even though I talked and I beat the chest of how big that 20 millimeter was on the Zero, there were some issues. It had the divergence I talked about where it was a different site, very small number of rounds that they carried. Uh, so I gave the edge to the, the P-40 because it had six 50 calibers and the 50 caliber was a very large shell in its, its own, but put against the very light, fragile zero, and it was more than enough to do significant damage with just a few rounds. So I gave the edge to the P-40 on that. The total rounds, you can see the numbers, the P-40 had a few more. That helps as well. Okay, now down to ruggedness, uh, even more of a subjective, that's why I highlighted the, the term ruggedness in yellow. So that's a very, very subjective opinion, but I easily gave that to the P-40 because as we found when we started shooting back at the Zero, that it was, it was pretty frail. And that light structure, the light aluminum, no armor, no self-sealing fuel tanks really came back to haunt the Japanese Navy there. Okay, airplanes. The Model 21 versus the P-40. So let's now talk about the Battle of Darwin. Okay, I'm going to kind of go through this rough flow as we talk about it, the area of operations, how the stage is set for a protracted uh, campaign, if you will, down there, some of the key air-to-air -air engagements, since we're still kind of focused on uh, airplane versus airplane here. 
and then the outcome. It's also known for those interested uh, in, in looking into Darwin, it's also known as the bombing of Darwin or the North Australian Air War. So here's your area of operations here. I've kind of put some flags uh, around that's not 100%. Uh, the, uh, the Japanese were expanding, as we've talked about. They had uh, a huge presence at Rabaul in uh, New Caledonia. We had, we being the Allies, had our largest presence was there in Port Moresby uh, on New Guinea. All of those little islands in Indonesia, the Japanese were uh, starting to occupy those and set up air bases. You can kind of see the arc. The arc is what the Japanese were in, uh, interested in. They were interested all the way from Broome in the west of Australia over to Horn Island, which is right off the top of the, uh, that long uh, peninsula in Queensland. And there right in the middle is Darwin. You can also see, I hope I've got a couple uh, dotted blue lines. Those were rough idea of the shipping routes that the Allies were using to move a uh, transshipment around the theater. So the stage is set. The Japanese want to continue expanding their empire. They want that southern co-prosperity sphere uh, expanded so that they can get all the natural resources they want. And they had the immediate goal as we enter 1942 of occupying the island of uh, Timor and Java. And by February of 42, Darwin is turned into a very important base for the Allies for that theater in uh, transshipment and in defense of the Dutch East Indies. So the objectives for the Japanese were to uh, prevent the Allies from using Darwin as a means to contest the Japanese invasions of Timor and Java. And the Allies wanted to defend their hub, since they had a nice hub, not only for that transshipment of goods via surface, but also that was the southern air ferry route as we were moving airplanes from Hawaii and that area onto the north part of Australia and then over into the Indonesian islands where we had an allied footprints. And then the dates, 19 February of 42 was the first attack. That was first the, the bombing of Darwin that kind of got that campaign. It went all the way through November of 43 uh, and there were almost 100 separate attacks uh, offensive operations by the Japanese against North Australia. Okay, of note, uh, relative to other campaigns in the area like uh, Guadalcanal and the Solomons and also New Guinea, where there were ground troops on both sides engaged in combat, this uh, campaign was almost entirely air to air. The only real ground forces were the Australian air defenses, shooting anti-aircraft artillery at the attacking airplanes. Both sides suffered heavy losses and we'll see how that impacts the outcome, especially for uh, the Japanese side. So some key engagements. So back to that first attack, 19 February, uh, 242 Japanese aircraft. Most of those, almost 190 off of four carriers. Same four carriers that were part of the six carrier a fleet that attacked Pearl Harbor, and all four of those carriers were the carriers that, unfortunately for them, steamed towards Midway. Okay, so that's the key to Bataille, the uh, carrier strike force. Uh, 36 of those, all from the carriers, were A6M20s. We only had 31 Allied aircraft to oppose them at the time. Ten of those were Army Air Corps P-40s that were just transitioning. They weren't really established yet. Most of those were training aircraft in the Royal Australian Air Force that had been modified for short notice combat operations. And still even more of those were twin engine bombers counted in the number of 31. So a very uh, pittance of an air defense at this time. Okay, heavy damage done to the aircraft, the shipping uh, in the port at very little cost to the attacking fleet. 30 of the Allied aircraft were destroyed. 
Uh, nine of the P-40s were either shot down or destroyed on the ground, and the one remaining had extensive battle damage to it. Okay, but the Allies quickly recovered. Uh, as we'll see a little later, MacArthur said, this is an important theater or important camp for my campaign. Uh, this is important. So we're going to start beefing up Darwin and North Australia. So they recovered quickly. Uh, we move a little bit later into March. Horn Island, which was the island right off the north part of that long peninsula on the uh, east side of Australia. Nine zeros versus nine P-40s uh, from the 7th Fighter Squadron. This 49th Fighter Group, which was the uh, first operational fighter unit to go into the area, even though Port Moresby was a larger entity at the time and more heavily attacked by the Japanese because MacArthur saw North Australia as critical, he sent his first operational U.S. fighter unit to Darwin, not to Port Moresby. Uh, the P-40s did some damage. They got up, they had some notice, and they, uh, they started uh, bloodying the enemy. Okay, a little later in March, this is now March of 42, so radar is not new. Right, Battle of Britain, the Germans were using it too in that engagement, so that's back in 40. Radar is still a young technology, still everyone's learning how to use it, but it's not new. And uh, so now they're starting, the Allies are starting to factor that into their air defense plan. In April, uh, some more bombers and Zeros are attacking Darwin, and here the P-40s put up a good fight. They shot down more than 50% of the attacking force at the loss of only three of the P-40s. Can you start to see a trend? Okay, this also restored confidence in the community. There weren't a lot of people living in Darwin at the time, and there was concern, especially after that February attack, where there was really almost no resistance given to 240 attacking airplanes. So they're restoring confidence in the community, uh, military presence is building up, it's all good. As we keep going, I won't go through all the details and the numbers here, uh, but the trend continues. The, uh, now here are the P-40s. I foot stomped during my Zero chat about the combat experience of the Zero pilots. Well, now these P-40 pilots are doing the same thing. They're tucking their combat experience into their belt and flying and fighting uh, accordingly. So things start to even out. There was a bad day in, in June, uh, but things are starting to good, and I'll po I will point out the July, the 30 July one, which was a very good example. There were um, visual spotters on the island of Timor who could radio back, hey, the Japanese just launched a fleet and they're flying south. There was the radar now getting more and more comfortable as far as integrating that into the air defense plan. And then there are the fighter pilots themselves sitting in the P-40s, getting more confident, improving their tactics, learning do not turn with a zero. Boy, in August, uh, they really turned the tide here, down 15 uh, aircraft of an, a fairly large attacking force. Uh, looked pretty good, and it was about this time that the, uh, the Air Force 49th Fighter Group rotated out. They had been in heavy contact uh, for about five months, and then the Royal Australians, also flying P-40s, took their place. Okay, so about 80 enemy aircraft knocked down, uh, about 20 of those zeros, to the loss of uh, 21 Kitty Hawks, P-40s. Force multipliers, I think I talked about that. The, uh, what does that do? That just helps the fighter pilots. The more advantage, we talked about altitude, and diving and climbing because you don't want to turn against a zero. So having altitude, the more advanced notice you have that here comes a raid, the sooner you can take off and you can gain that altitude and be above them when you, uh, when you merge with that strike force. Outcome, the Japanese were able to continue their offensive for a rather long period of time and they were able to delay somewhat and disrupt the Allied war effort and their, the um, transshipment and the moving of supplies. Darwin ended up being the second most attacked area behind Port Mor Moresby. Okay, the Allies largely abandoned 
Darwin as far as a port, but they continued to beef up their air defenses. And all through this part, 42, early 43, uh, MacArthur, as he was starting his campaign, right, we landed on the Solomons, the Navy started doing the island hopping, uh, so into New Guinea, targeting the Philippines as the campaign progressed. Throughout this, MacArthur had this tender left flank as he's moving northwest towards the home islands of the Indonesia area and the concern about an invasion of Australia. So it was always on his mind, this tender left flank, flank of his. As far as air to air there, the uh, Air Corps and then the Air Force P-40s, they bore the brunt of the early uh, fighting there by mid 40, the early to mid 43 Spitfires had started arriving, hence our, our interest in the Spitfire. But early on it was the P-40s, mostly the 49th Fighter Group, but also uh, numerous uh, Royal Australian Air Force units. Okay, here's where they uh, developed and mastered the diving attack. Tom talked about it in his pilot training for P-40 pilots to learn to take advantage of your uh, aircraft strengths, and that was speed. So these diving attacks, and they, they mastered that and put that to uh, great effect. And they managed a very, very respectable one-to-one uh, -one kill ratio against uh, the zero. So I think I kind of echo what Tom said. Generally, historians don't look at the P-40 as, as being you know, a, a key contributor to the Allied air war. And the more you peel back the facts, the more you say that airplane's been slighted. That airplane started off against a, an extremely capable and nimble airplane and held their own and then some. Okay, the Battle of Darwin. What we want to do real quickly right now is we're going to talk about that airplane, that specific airplane that's sitting on the ramp out there, and then Tom's going to talk about that other one. So here's the story of our X-133. Another map up there, you can see Babo Airfield on the western part of the island of New Guinea. Uh, was a Dutch airfield uh, in, the early, in the late 30s and early 40s, and the Japanese um, invaded and occupied the island and took over, and they had a fairly large going concern airfield at Babo Airfield to conduct uh, land-based attacks from that area. Well, they just abandoned it. There was a ground campaign in New Guinea that went westward, mostly uh, Australian ground forces against the Japanese. So as best we can figure, about the summer of 44, the Japanese just abandoned Babo Airfield and left what was there, there. So you can see a couple photos. The bottom left was taken in 73, the bottom right in 91 of what ended up being that airplane. It sat in the jungles there on New Guinea for about 45 years. And then the right guy, David Price at the Santa Monica Museum of Flying, had the right motivation and patience and money. And he pulled three hulks out of the jungle. If you look on the bottom left, you see the crate? A little bit hard to see, but that's one piece. Remember I said the Zero was manufactured, the wing and the forward fuselage is one piece. So that's kind of how that, why that crate looks a little funky. And then the bottom right shows the empennage. So there's the fuselage that just bolts on right behind the, the cockpit is stuffed into that. Uh, top right is the engine. You can't see it very well, but boy would we pay a couple dollars to get that thing because it's kind of been lost in history. Where is that Nakajima Sakai engine that was sitting right next to the airplane in 91 when they pulled it out? I don't know. We would love to know. Okay, so here it is now in the hangar in Santa Monica. So you can see it's kind of been uh, laid out in the top left, pieces and parts. If you look right at the uh, top left photo, right in front of the airplane, you can see the engine mount. So the engine mount somehow survived the transshipment and the uh, restoration that went down. You can see the underside of one of the wings. It's hard to point out, 
but on the far right side, this is the top right photo, the far right side of that wing, you can kind of see some of the hinging and the locking me mechanism of how that wing tip folds. So here we have the guys getting to work. So that top left, that's Bill Carbone. And he was volunteer at the museum. This is in 92. He works with us now. He volunteers and he helps us with our aluminum work on all our airplanes at the, the CAF. Uh, so he, there he is doing work on the empennage. And if, when you get to see the aluminum work on there, it's fabulous. And it's hard to see in this photo, but that's how much of that airplane right there really came out of the jungle. Well, none of that aluminum. The aluminum skin didn't last 45 years in the jungle. So that's all new. All the wiring is new. Those are the original landing gear. Part of the, the base of the cockpit survived and a lot of the internals of the tail, so the formers, the ribs, the spars, were good. None of the aluminum. So here you can see top left, uh, Billy putting new aluminum over what he could salvage from the structure of the tail. Some of the pieces and parts there on the bottom left, some uh, Japanese um, media people got wind of what was happening. They were all fired up. So you can see an article in a Japanese a newspaper and they sent the blueprints for a zero. So they contacted the right people at Mitsubishi and they sent the blueprints to David Price at the Santa Monica Museum of Flying. Pretty cool, international. Okay, so then what David found out was, boy, this is taking a long time and I got three of these things to put together. So we shipped them all to Russia. So what's going on in Russia? A couple things here in the early 90s. The walls come down so you have a lot of cheap, highly skilled laborers who know how to build airplanes. And at the same time, there was a movement in the emerging warbird community to build new, new build Yak 3s. So Yak, the company, took old specs, old jigs with current people and made 10 Yak 3s. And that's what you see on the top photo the, uh, the primered airplanes in the front are Yak-3s, new build Yak-3s in the early 90s. Right behind it, the silver tail, is that airplane's tail cone that we just saw Bill Carbone putting aluminum on. You can see in the bottom two photos, they're starting to put together the rest. You know, they, they saved what they could. Wasn't a great deal. A6M3 Type 0 Model 22. This, this was interesting when David Price sent those three pieces and parts to Russia, he said, I want everything done, firewall aft. Don't put engines on them. Ship them back. I'm gonna get rid of a couple of them. I may keep one, whatever, but we'll let the new owners or myself, we'll chew on it for a couple years and decide what engines to put on them. And all three owners, David kept one of them, kept this one, and then the other two owners all put Pratt & Whitney 1830s on it, a DC-3 engine. Uh, very interesting, I'll tell that little tale when we go outside. Okay, so that's a Pratt, it's an American Pratt & Whitney. Uh, so it came back to the States, all three of them. It went to the Chena Boys, um, Steve Hinton's group, put a Pratt & Whitney 1830 on it, so fighter rebuilders did that, put the airplane on it, did everything firefall fo firewall forward, took care of all the paperwork with the FAA, flew it out of Mojave in 98, signed off. You have a flying airplane, experimental airplane in 1998. David kept it for about five years and then sold it to the CAF in 03, and there it is. It's been flying ever since. My story, because um, it has in my times here, you guys seem to care. Okay, I flew F-16s in the Air Force where I built up a lot of time. Yeah, that's a jet, obviously, uh, but it's single, eight, single seat, single engine. In my last year using, in uniform, I got involved with the air show at the big Air Force base in Las Vegas and really, really badly got bitten by the warbird bug. Badly. Uh, so I was able to buy into a T-6 and I think you'll find most guys flying Warbird fighters today, the road to the fighter is through a T-6. So I built up a lot of time in the T-6, 
uh, through the air show. I befriended these guys. I got to know this uh, CAF unit, and I joined and volunteered with those, those people. Uh, I had enough hours, so you know, I had to do a little FaceTime, had to take out some trash, had to sweep some floors. It's, a big or it's an organization that needs everything, so you have to do your time. And I got into the fighter program. The fighter program starts in the back seat of a T-6. So now you go up, there's a profile, you, le you learn to do everything, everything from the back seat of a T-6. And if you can, and they're happy with you, then they put you in a fighter. So our process, we kind of like putting a, a new fighter guy, fighter warbird guy in either the Zero, we also have an F-6F Hellcat first, because they're just very similar pictures. When you talk about the picture of takeoff, fly, land, these airplanes, even though there's more, more ho horsepower in different dimensions, it's the same kind of picture as in the T-6. So it's an easy transition. And um, been flying that thing for four to five years now, have built up a fair amount of time. I was the zero guy for a while. I didn't object. Um, and I think that's about it. So I'm now going to hand this off to Tom, and he's going to talk about that airplane and Tom's story. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so we're going to talk about the P-40. So that P-40 is a combat veteran, and it never left North America. So how crazy is that? So the airplane was built in 1943 back in New York, and it was stationed with the, the Royal Canadian Air Force up in British Columbia. And it was basically a shore patrol airplane, so it'd be out flying around looking for you know, submarines or maybe looking for, they're always fearful of a, of a, a, a sea-launched uh, assault on our, our mutual shore, uh, shores. So the pilot was flying around, I, Frank knows his name, right? it was a Patton? Flight Lieutenant Patton was flying the airplane, and guess what? The Japanese, over time, over a two and a half year period of time, launched 9,000 balloons. We're talking 30 foot diameter envelopes with 50 pound incendiary bombs on them. They'd get them up in the jet stream and then hopefully they'd come over to the United States. So about 900 of them, they think, actually landed over here in Mexico, United States, and Canada. And I counted 17 states, as east as Michigan. So he's thinking of the land, they were, they were hoping to land in cities and start fires and forest fires and everything else. Fortunately, they, they weren't all that effective, fortunately. However, um, uh, uh, Flight Officer Patton is flying around and he sees one of these things coming on shore. And so he f climbed up to about 12,000 feet, shoots it down over an island right before it was gonna get to Vancouver. So that airplane is actually a combat veteran. How, how great is that? <laughs> so we'll, we'll take it, right, we'll take it. Airplanes retired from military service in 1946, and it was sold to a new owner in Seattle. And it was actually delivered on a barge. So they, they flipped the thing down to Seattle, they put it back together to get it flying, and he sold it to a company in San Jose that was involved in the cloud seeding business. So they had these iodine pellets, and they'd dump them out and try and get clouds to form and make it rain. Make it rain. So it was doing that actually in Colorado when it suffered a gear up landing. And so it slid in, landing gear didn't, didn't function properly, and it was pretty much stricken as junk. Ed Maloney, the, the founder of Planes of Fame Museum in Chino, buys the airplane, ships it to Chino, or maybe Ontario, I'm not sure actually where it ended up, maybe in Claremont at that time, I'm not totally sure, and they put it back in a static display condition. Then in the late 1970s, Steve Hinton and and some of the other Chino guys put the thing back together and got it flying in 1981. And so there it sits today. The airplane um, was in, a, in the Pearl Harbor movie in, in 2001. It was shipped over on a barge to Hawaii with a bunch of other P-40s that we rounded up and our B-25. And, and a, that's a, that may be a picture of it right there flying them up. It's a great flying airplane. We're happy to have it. I started flying it in 2008, and I really, really enjoy flying it. It's just a classic, classic airplane. I think there are 28 of them left flying today. Okay, my story. I, I have kind of a funny story. I'm not, not a military guy like Rob is, but when I was eight years old, every Friday night I would watch 12 o'clock high. And so, I don't, maybe you guys know too, okay. So I'm watching 12 o'clock high and I'm really getting enamored with all, just all of the, remember they used to have the real film, film clips and they would have the stuff they would act in and add in. 
And so I'd watch that all the time. I started reading books about the Flying Tigers and Jimmy Doolittle and Joe Foss and all these guys. And then I got my pilot license in 1977. In 79, probably one of the other pivotal events of my life, I went to an air show in a place called Harlingen, Texas. So the, Com the Confederate Air Force back in that day was there. It was a four-day air show. There were over 120 airplanes flying around. It was unbelievable. Heinkel HE-111s and Messerschmitts and all the American hardware, A-20s. I mean, it was amazing. All the stuff was flying around. So I really, really got, got, got enamored with that. I joined the organization. I went to them, and I said, hey, I'd love to fly with you guys and get involved. They gave me kind of a cold face. Well, guess what? Guess how old the World War II pilots were in 1979? They were 56 years old. They didn't need a 20-year-old kid. You know, they, they had no interest in me whatsoever. I went back to San Jose, where I was living at the time, and I found a group called the California Warbirds. And right before I got in, they had a Hellcat, a BT-13, a Mustang, and a T-6. The Hellcat was sold to the Yanks Air Museum in Chino. It's now at Plains of Fame having an engine change done to it. But anyway, so I, I, got, I checked out in the T-6 in 1981. Got about 50 hours in it, started flying the Mustang in 1983. I just kept at it, just got really, really involved, really, really enjoyed it. I bought my own T6 in 1990, started flying it around. I moved down to Southern California about that same time, got involved with the Plains of Fame as a volunteer, started flying for them in 2001. And I've been one of their primary ride pilots, you know, taking rides in the Mustang, the P40 since then. And I've been getting about 75 hours a year flying, you know, just some airplane for some, some mission, you know, with Plains of Fame since then. Also fly the, um, the SBD Dauntless, the TBM Avenger a little bit, right seat in the B-25. And so it's just been a, a really, really fabulous time. And then my, my most recent check off the box aviation event was, I got to race at Reno last year in the P-51. So that, that was like a dream since 1977, always going up and watching it. And so I got a chance to do that last year and it was fantastic. So hoping to do that again this September. So that's my story, so thank you very much. Last night at dinner, I was uh, talking with Tom about his air racing thing last year, last September, and uh, he shared it was intense. And uh, that's something I haven't been able to do, especially not in a Warbird, uh, but uh, You'll like it when you do that's it. real flying up there. That, that's hard call. Okay. Back, oh, and it also struck me, Frank, correct me if I'm wrong, that Zero flew in the 2001 movie Pearl Harbor. Okay, so though we can't prove it, no, um, that zero was pulled out of a what had been a combat airfield of the Japanese. I think odds are that's a combat zero. And we have a combat P-40, and then we have two movie stars out there too. So how'd that work out for us? We have gone a little bit long here. I'm going to ask your patience. How about just a couple questions for Tom or I? The question is, how did he place in the race uh, up at Reno? We had a great time. We raced uh, uh, on Saturday in the bronze, and we raced against a Spitfire, a P-40, a Corsair, another Mustang, I guess maybe two other Mustangs. We won the bronze on Saturday. That's a good thing and a bad thing, because at Reno, when you win on Saturday, guess what? You move up. And so I ended up on Sunday running the silver class with seven Mustangs. And we had a limitation on the amount of power we we're gonna run, which was our, it's called maximum except takeoff. So it's about 330 miles an hour, something like that in a Mustang, stock Mustang. And so they were running takeoff power. So we had a really good time, but I got last in the silver. <laughs> uh, the question was, he can see the folding wingtips, but he can't see the tail hook. Uh, first of all, it does have a tail hook. And when we do the walk around, I'll point that out. Uh, it's not functioning today. That's okay, we don't need it to be. But uh, for the other part, the army, the, the Japanese army did not have any zero. The zero was strictly a uh, Japanese Navy airplane. And it had, uh, they didn't change the models or anything, but they had land base, and then they had the carrier base. The carrier based ones, you kind of, you may have seen photos, uh, this off-white color, but they did paint their land-based zeros like that. So it is a Navy airplane, it's just land-based, it does have a tail hook. Uh, the question is why you don't want to turn with the zero. Uh, 
And the bottom line, if we go back early to our presentation, that low wing loading that the Zero had, low stall speeds, the Zero could just fly a tighter, right? When you talk about a, a 1v1 dogfight, there's two aspects of this turn. There's turn rate and there's turn radius. So what you want is a small turn radius so you can turn inside the other airplane and then you want a high turn rate because regardless of your turn radius, do you want to walk around the circle or do you want to run around the circle? Well, you want to run around a small circle. When, you're, when your turn rate and radius is better than the other airplane, and if the other airplane stays in a turning fight, you're gonna get behind them so you could employ your guns. And the Zero had a better turn rate and turn radius than the P-40. So it could, if you got slow with the low wing loading, which allows that tighter, faster turn, that was advantageous. A question was later in the war, were the Zeros used as kamikazes? Absolutely. And that's where they started mounting uh, up to 500 pound bombs. So as the war progressed, the progression of the Zeros capabilities and new airplanes coming out of Japan's industry did not keep up with the Allies increased more capable airplanes and obviously the numbers, you know, our production was off the chart. So by late 40, uh, early 44, you know, the Hellcats are starting to get into theater in numbers in late 43. By the time of the Marianas Turkey shoot, the uh, Battle of the Philippine Sea, the Zero is really obsolete. Uh, but that's what they had. That's what they were still able to produce. So their thought was, uh, how are we going to stop this blue wave and all of these gray ships coming our way? And that's one of the reasons they, one of the things they came up with, the kamikaze, so they put bombs on them, and yes, they crashed zeros into capital ships. Okay, the question is, how did the P-40 do in the Battle of the Coral Sea? Um, I'm going to tell you my opinion. The, the thing about the Coral Sea that stands out as far as uh, this was important about that battle, was it was strictly a carrier-based aircraft versus carrier-based aircraft. The fleets never saw each other. And so based on that, though in the North Africa campaign and invasion, P-40s flew a limited amount off of carriers, uh, it was a Navy, Navy versus Navy, as far as I know, Carol's. Yeah. Okay, so we have a guy in the audience who knows more than us. Awesome. Okay, so the answer is uh, the P-40s did not participate in any material way in the Battle of the Coral Sea. In the United States, they were built in St. Louis, in, in Ohio, and in New York. And then they had, uh, there, were, there were some built under license in foreign countries. I don't know which ones off the top of my head, but they were, there were a few built under license. In the United States, yes. So the question was, were they built anywhere other than New York? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.